So, for the third game that I'm showing you guys, we're going to be focusing on the second core opening principle, and that is on the importance of development. We already saw in the previous games that we looked at that development there was also a factor, as was the third uh, key principle of king safety that we'll look at soon. But that's unavoidable in chess. Every game will always combine many different elements. Every game, in a sense, tells a rich story. But for this one and the following two games, our focus is going to be turned towards development. So this is another game played by Mr. Greco many, many years ago. And white opened with e4, black responded with e5, bishop to c4, the bishop's opening, bishop to c5, and white played queen to e2. Now this particular opening setup is not very fashionable these days. It's not considered to be especially good, but at the time, this was what was understood about chess. So many people played in this so-called romantic style. The queen comes out very early on. Uh, nowadays, in general, white refrains from doing so, as does black, because better to bring out the minor pieces before you venture with your queen. So black responded in kind with queen to e7, and white played this move f4. And we've already seen this before. The idea being to lure away the black e pawn by making a sacrifice of the f pawn, a king's gambit style. Now, black accepted the pawn with e takes f4, and we see that white now has two pawns in the center, the e-file pawn and the d-file pawn, versus only one for black. So white plays knight to f3, preparing to push in the center with d4, and if he can have his way, he will then capture the pawn on f4 next move. Now black anticipates this and plays g5, defending the pawn on f4, and white undermines the defender, right, with the move h4. Now, we should notice one thing, that in terms of development, for now, white is a little bit ahead, but for now, nothing too serious has happened, right? You have both sides with a bishop, both sides with the queen developed, and so really there's two elements going on. The first one is the issue of central control. After white pushes the pawn to d4, he's going to have a better center, so we've already discussed this topic. And then the second one is that, well, white has one minor piece more developed than black. So he has a little bit of an edge, but that's to be expected because he is white and he was able to play the first move. However, after the next move f6, black starts to go wrong. And the reason is that now this diagonal has been weakened, this diagonal has been weakened, so there are going to be more possibilities for an open game, right? And as the game opens, we notice that with white's next move, h takes g5, and black's response, f takes g5, in fact, white, in a sense, has developed. And it's easy to miss this kind of development, because what's happened is that by opening up the h file with this move, h takes g5, white, in fact, has developed that rook. Even though the rook has not moved, before there was a pawn. In the starting square, the pawn was on h2, but now the rook has a semi-open file, and so it's already influencing the game. If we look at this rook, it's targeting this pawn on h7, and it's x-raying the rook on h8, and this is quite significant. So now white has two extra pieces developed instead of just one for black, and on top of that, it's his move, so he plays the move knight to c3, and now he has three pieces. And we see that already black has to be very careful. The threat is knight to d5. And so black plays the move c6. But we should take a look at one thing. Notice how many pawn moves black has played. He's played the move c6. He's also played f takes g5. He's played g5. He's made many, many pawn moves in recent times. And this is going to be problematic. White plays d4. Now he has that beautiful central control. And black 
does not move the bishop, but instead plays g4. Hitting the knight on f3, so countering white's threat with a threat of his own. The problem with this is that white's pawn push seized the center and this diagonal for the dark squared bishop. However, from black's point of view, with his pawn move, he in fact weakens control of that f4 point, meaning that in the future, bishop takes f4 will happen. And he also is going to have a vulnerable pawn on g4, which after the knight moves, can be at any given moment taken by the white queen. So black's pawn move, in fact, creates many weaknesses here on the king side, whereas white's pawn move improves his development. So it's no surprise that white had a strong response to this move g4. He played knight to h4, and now we see the idea behind black's play. The point was that the knight, being the defender of the pawn on d4, after it gets kicked out, black captures on d4 and wins a pawn. Problem is, as a general rule, to go pawn grabbing when you're behind in development is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And we see this after the move knight to f5, white creates a double attack against the black queen. Now, black plays bishop takes c3 check an intermezzo, an in-between move, and after b takes c3, now he moves his queen to f6. Now, if we take a look at this position, many beginning players would think that actually black is doing quite well here, because they would count the material, and they would say right now, black, even after the move bishop takes f4, is actually up a pawn. And on top of this, black has an attack on this pawn, which is a doubled and isolated pawn. And so, in fact, with his next move, queen takes c3, black will once again recover that two pawn material lead. And so many players would think that here only black can be better. But the problem is that after king to f2, which is a necessary move because if white were to block with moves like this, then he really would be in trouble because this rook would be falling. So with king f2, white defends the rook on a1. But we see this position, and even though at first sight, it would appear like black is doing well, because white's king can no longer castle, and he's up a couple of pawns, the real crucial factor here is development. And we see that very clearly. We see that all three minor pieces have been developed onto very promising central squares. Notice that central control is also there. And on the other hand, if we contrast that with black's minor pieces, we see that they're all under starting squares. So this means that white's attacking firepower is just going to be too great. And black is unlikely to be able to do anything in the face of an assault that combines all of the white minor pieces and perhaps also the queen. Black played the move b5, which is a further mistake. The position was already very difficult, but b5 is simply a queenside pawn push that does create a threat on the bishop, but after white's response, bishop to b3, there is no problem for white. White is happy to bring the bishop here. And black pushes again a5, presumably with the threat of a4, but even that is not actually threatening to capture a piece or anything like that, because white can simply take on g8 if needs be. But again, we see that this kind of approach, when the king is in the middle of the board and the minor pieces are all undeveloped, is very, very risky. Pawn grabbing, as black has done here and earlier with the move e takes f4 and then hanging on to that pawn with g5. So that kind of pawn grabbing, when you're falling behind in development, you're using your tempi to collect pawns instead of to bring your king to safety and to develop your pieces, that's very, very dangerous. And similarly, pawn pushing, again, ignoring, same thing, ignoring the development of your pieces and bringing your king to safety is also extremely risky. And let's take a look at what happened. 
Well, white gave this check on d6. Black had to move his king and he went to d8. And now white grabbed the pawn on g4. But he's not really pawn grabbing in the same way that black was pawn grabbing. The importance from white's perspective, the reason why he took here, is because he wants to bring his queen into the game. In the future, the queen may go to g5 with check, or it may go to g7 and hit this rook if the black queen leaves the control of this square. Let's say, for example, if the black queen at some point gives a check here and white would respond with king f3, and then the threat of queen g7 would be a possibility. But of course, it's a nice bonus that white gains a pawn. Black played the move knight to e7, but there was not too many alternatives. Black, for example, cannot run with his king to the queen side, because now knight takes b5 would be a double discovered check, and next move, black is picking up this queen. Right? So king to b7, let's say knight takes c3, and it's game over. Other than that, black, for example, he could not move his king to e7 because this bishop is undefended. So white would simply win a piece. And black could give this check on d4, but after king to e2, the checks are over and black has not improved his position. In fact, the queen here is a little bit more vulnerable because in the future, white can play rook to d1 and gain time because the black queen will have to move. So in the game, black played the move knight to e7. White gave this check, and now king to e8. Now, in this particular situation, white could already win a rook, but instead he chose to be a little bit more ambitious because he has so much development and he has the possibility of an attack against the weak black king. He simply played the move queen to h5. Now, what's nice about this particular move is that if black were to play a move like knight to g6, now white could consider grabbing this rook, and after queen takes rook, remember what we said about the development of this rook on h1. Earlier at the start of the video, we said that the rook on h1, after the moves h takes g5 and f takes g5, if you remember, well, the rook on h1 even though it has stayed on its starting square, is now developed. And I mentioned that it was because there was an attack on the h7 point and also an x-ray on that h8 rook at the time. And there's no longer a rook, but there's a queen. And unsurprisingly, white has a nice combination. Queen takes knight with check. After pawn takes queen, rook takes queen. And we see that activity of the rook on h1 because of the semi-open h-file finally bears fruit. And not only white won a piece, but after the black king moves, white actually can collect a second piece. And that's not even the end of the story because right now the knight is pinned to the rook and attacked twice. So it's going to be very, very difficult for black to avoid losing even more material. So this is quite a common occurrence when you ignore your development. Everything sort of collapses like this, like a house of cards. So let's see what actually happened in the game. After queen to h5, black absolutely did not block on g6 because of the line that we've seen. And instead gave this check on d4. White played king to f3, defending the pawn. And now black played the move queen c3 check. and white now drops his king back to e2, and the checks are finished. There is no good check to give against the king. And the problem is that now white will start with his threats. Black cannot block because of the same line that we've just looked at. And there are not many options. He cannot move the king here because of this. And if he moves the king to f8, then bishop h6 check is devastating. So, black instead played rook to f8. But this allowed a beautiful finish. And white did indeed spot it. He played the move knight d6 check. The king went to d8, only move. And now white sacrificed his queen. And the idea is that after queen e8 check, 
Rook takes queen. Knight f7 is checkmate. The sacrifice of the queen on e8 was done in order to set up this smothered mate. So a beautiful finish, but the important takeaway from this particular game and the games that will follow is to never ignore development. It's a core opening principle. And if you are behind in development, you should make that a top priority. So bring out your pieces to the best squares that you can identify. And also be very careful not to pawn push like black did here with moves like b5 and a5, and not to pawn grab like black did by grabbing that pawn on f4 and then grabbing the pawn on c3. Sometimes it's okay to do both of those, but if you do too much of that, it's going to backfire a huge percentage of the time. And that's a very common beginner's mistake, so please keep that in mind. Okay, that's it for the first game on the topic of development. Let's take a look at the next game.